Nurse Midwives and Managing Pregnancy, the IOM Report on Meaningful Health Discussion, Medicare Zaps Hospital Readmissions, and we're going to take a look at a special segment with Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center on hydrocarbon toxicity. If that's what you're looking for, you found it. It's The Nursing Show. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Nursing Show. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, and I'd like to welcome everybody to the program this week. We have a lot of good stuff coming up for you in this week's look at the nursing news. And we'll also be getting into a special segment with our good friend Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center as she brings us a segment on hydrocarbon toxicity later on in this episode. Before we get to all that, I do want to remind you to follow up on all of the information you'll find in this and every other episode over at the Nursing Show website. You can head over to nursingshow.com, and when you get there, you will find a link at the top of the page for show notes. You can click that link and find all of the episodes with the most recent episode listed first and scroll on back to find whatever episode you're looking for. And you can follow up on the links to the news items and additional resources having to do with our tip each week. So make sure you do that and get the most in-depth information so that you understand how to apply the things discussed in this episode to your own nursing scope of practice. That's going to be your job. I'll try to prevent the most present the most uh, complete information here on the show, and I will rely on you to make sure you have full understanding of how to apply that with the additional resources and your own scope of practice. If you want to get back in touch with me, you can certainly do that. Follow up with me by email. Send those emails into nursingshow at gmail.com. I love to hear from each and every one of you, and it's great to get those emails, so keep them coming in. I hear from a lot of students this time of year as they are getting into the meat of their nursing classes, and uh, so just want to give you all a, a thumbs up and uh, offer you kudos for choosing nursing as a profession, and hang in there. You know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. You will graduate. Just keep doing the work, keep putting in the time, keep doing the studying, and keep working hard to become that nurse you want to be, and it will happen for you. So I, I wish you all encouragement and support. And of course, for the rest of the nursing show community, you know, reach out to the nursing students that you come in contact with and make sure you're providing them the support and assistance they need to become the best nurses they can be. That's it. We'll have some more contact information later on in this episode, but let's go ahead and head on out so we can get into the news. New information just in from the American College of Nurse Midwives is showing that women who are pregnant and have had babies recently are not communicating adequately with their healthcare professionals, whether they be nurse midwives or obstetricians, uh, there is, seems to be a lot of evidence that these women are not engaging their healthcare professionals in meaningful conversations about how to manage their pregnancies. 62% uh, said their care provider did not discuss how to stay healthy during their pregnancy. 80% said that preparing for motherhood was never discussed. And 50% said only 50% said their provider spent a great deal of time with them during labor and birth. So uh, that means that half of the providers weren't even around or in the room or nearby for most of that process. And you know, that, that is not saying a whole lot for the people that are supporting uh, childbirth in the U.S. right now. So of course we know that the vast majority of them are probably obstetricians and we're not here to bash the doctors. But the nurse midwives are saying that uh, there is a need here for more contact, more association with good health practices, modeling good health practices, and discussion with the patient about what it is they need to have a healthy, safe, and happy pregnancy. And I think all of that is important. Now, uh, some of the information here looks at uh, that the number of nurse midwife attended childbirths is up in the U.S., reaching a record high at the last reported figures, 2010, of 8.4% of the births attended by a nurse midwife. 
And New Mexico, one of the highest state in the survey, 37.6% of women chose to use a midwife with their vaginal births in 2010. Uh, so certainly nurse midwives are, are making a comeback. I think for a long time, many, many centuries, nurse midwives were the primary resource during childbirth. And it's interesting to see that the healthcare system has treated this natural function of reproduction as a clinical disease process rather than as something that just naturally occurs often on its own without any assistance. Now, of course, we want to have trained medical professionals overseeing childbirth to be there to watch out for any complications and take care of these patients appropriately. But there is something to be said for having that nursing approach, that holistic approach to patient care and giving uh, women in healthcare and women in childbirth and pregnancy the resources they need to have a completely healthy and happy and successful pregnancy. We'll be following up with more on this and maybe we can actually access a couple of nurse midwives and bring them on the show to discuss how this process is being handled when they attend a pregnancy and childbirth pro process with their patients. So we'll continue to watch for this. Now in that previous article, we looked at women who were pregnant and experiencing childbirth talking about their meaningful contact or lack of meaningful contact with their healthcare providers during childbirth and during their pregnancy, um, this isn't limited to pregnant women. In fact, this is a large scale problem where patients are not feeling connected to their own health care. And this is a problem. This is an issue. Um, patients should be engaged in a partnership to manage their health care, right? Well, the Institute of Medicine released a survey and report looking at patients desiring meaningful discussions with their healthcare providers. Now, I don't just limit this to physicians. This includes nurse practitioners and other advanced practice nursing programs. And of course, I think all the nurses. Uh, I think nurses as a whole, we're very good at engaging with our patients. But when patients are trying to make difficult decisions regarding their healthcare, they want to have a deep, meaningful discussion with their healthcare providers. And they want to have three key essential elements be part of that discussion. According to this article, people want to have timely access to the best evidence-based medical information. They want their providers to give them a sound, unbiased counsel about the process that the patients are experiencing based on the provider's clinical expertise. And the patients also need to have their families and their own goals and thought process included in the decision-making process and fully honored. Uh, this is from this report and it's an important part of this process. So we need to talk to our patients, give them the information about what's going on, what evidence-based practices, what best, what best treatment options there are based upon research and give them that information to make an objective decision. We need to give them our professional opinion about what we think they should do or what, our, what their options are. And then we need to listen to them. Key point there, we need to stop talking to them don't talk at them and listen to them and hear what their goals for their life, for their health care, for their current process of disease are. And we need to respect those goals and decisions. So this is going to be something that needs to be addressed. The Institute of Medicine has been really working very hard on creating a, a teamwork approach between patients and healthcare so that they can make better decisions about their healthcare. And because they're more engaged in healthcare, continue to lower the costs of healthcare because a healthier patient means that they are not going to incur as many costs. So this is all part of that process of reforming a healthcare system. Remember, we don't just talk about one aspect of it. It's the trial lawyer's fault. It's malpractice insurance fault. It's this person's fault. No, it's, it's a big problem with many, many facets. And this is one of them. To have an informed, educated patient who can make their decisions in teamwork and collaboration with their healthcare team. And I think that this is just another part of that process. So we'll continue to follow up on this, of course, as well. 
Speaking of health care reform, as we did in our last article here this week, we need to talk about one of the big changes that just went into effect with the Affordable Care Act. That's right. Medicare will now be limiting the reimbursement for patients who were readmitted with certain conditions within 30 days of hospital discharge. And this is the focus on the problem of patients having hospital acquired problems, situations that they have been sent home, not stabilized appropriately, not given out of hospital home care resources, not followed up on by primary care or other post-acute care resources, and these patients end up becoming, uh, getting readmitted. The numbers are pretty astounding. Based on a 2005 study from the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, they reported that 17.6% of hospital admissions resulted in readmission within 30 days. 11.3% in 15 days and 6.2% if within seven days. Now, we're looking at 30% of the hospital readmissions being largely preventable related to things like COPD, pneumonia, myocardial infarction, patients that have had a recent bypass, heart bypass, and other problems related to vascular procedures that have um, caused infection, things like that. And these things can be largely prevented through home care resources and giving the patients the appropriate information and making sure they understand the information they receive on discharge. You know, this is a big pet peeve of mine. You've heard me talk about it here on the show in the past. And it has to do with nurses who just go down the checklist when they go through patient discharge, just read through the checklist, monotone, they don't really care. They don't make eye contact with the patient. They're not seeing if the patient's getting any of this. And then they say, here, sign on the bottom and you can go home. Now, hey, I get it. It's been a long day. You've got a lot of patients to get to. The patient's in a hurry to get home. They don't want to sit there and listen to you go through all this stuff. You know, there needs to be a better way. That better way is often a follow-up call from an RN to go over those patient discharge instructions. Sure, go over the information. Make sure you highlight the stuff they can do on the way home. Like, hey, drop off this prescription on your way home and then somebody can run back out and pick it up. Those are the kind of things they need to know that'll save them some steps. But then six hours later or maybe the next morning, a nurse schedules a call to call in and go over those instructions in detail. It can be done over the phone, it can be done very effectively, and the patient has been home now for 12 hours, they've slept in their own bed, they're much more comfortable, they're much more relaxed, and they can pay attention to what you're saying. This is so important, and we miss out on these kinds of things. And that's just one aspect of why patients end up getting readmitted to the hospital, just because they didn't understand their discharge instructions. There's a whole lot more to it, and there are a whole lot of many more facets that can be added to this, but this again goes back to healthcare reform is multifaceted, and the solutions to healthcare reform are multifaceted. One of those things is making sure that we don't have patients come back to the hospital needlessly when we could have treated them much more cost effectively and much more conveniently for everyone at home in a home care setting where they don't have to be in the hospital. So let's uh, continue to keep a look at this. And uh, this is going to be something that's phased in over time. Uh, right now, they're only going to be looking at certain disorders. Uh, they're looking at patients with uh, congestive heart failure, uh, patients with pneumonia. Uh, but, and uh, they will be looking at those things now. Then in 2015, they're going to add COPD patients, bypass graft patients, and patients with venous uh, vascular conditions that needed readmission. So all of these things are going to be phased in in 2015. But for now, we need to be looking at these hospital readmissions because we're looking at $125,000 on average being given to the 2,000 hospitals that are expected to be penalized under this system this year. And that's a significant amount of money your hospital could be saving if they would just think about something like a telehealth nursing program to follow up with patients after discharge. You know, I think it's a, a less expensive prospect when your average cost is going to be $125,000 in penalties from Medicare. 
So we'll have to keep looking at this and we'll continue to follow this story as we get more data in over the coming months on how hospitals are actually doing in this new Medicare reimbursement program. Time now for this week's tip of the week, and we have Lisa Booz rejoining us. This is a previously recorded phone call that I had with Lisa, and she wanted to talk to us about hydrocarbon toxicity, primarily hydrocarbon aspiration and the pneumonitis and things that occur as a result of that. So let's get into this segment with Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center. Back now with another segment with our good friend Lisa Booz from the Maryland Poison Center at mdpoison.com. And Lisa, you come back with, with some interesting facts and information on various different topics. Uh, what are you bringing in today? Well, today I'd like to talk about hydrocarbon ingestions. This is a very common call to poison centers and probably a, a, a number of the EMS providers and other healthcare providers that listen to your podcast have been confronted with a, an ingestion of one of these products. They're just very, very common products in the home. And um, so it's important to know exactly what the toxicity is with these products. So I'd like to just start giving you two scenarios. These are two common cases that poison centers would hear about. The first is a two-year-old girl that's found with an empty bottle of lamp oil. According to the parent that was there with the child, the bottle had actually been thrown in the trash the day before because it was empty. So it only had maybe a few drops, just a residue in the bottom of the bottle. The mother called the poison center saying that the child's mouth smelled like the lamp oil and that she was coughing and choking a lot and she was having some problems breathing. So she was instructed to call 911 immediately. And upon arrival of EMS, the child was very short of breath. She was becoming progressively more lethargic to the point that she could not even hold her head up. Her oxygen saturation was 84%, and she did require intubation prior to transporting the child to the emergency department. Um, and this was just a little bit, just maybe even a few drops of lamp oil. The second scenario is a 35-year-old man that was siphoning gasoline from his car into a gas can so that he could fill his lawnmower with the gas. He estimates that he swallowed about a mouthful when some went into his mouth, and he's doing a lot of coughing. He's breathing okay, but he's doing a lot of coughing as well. So both of these cases are typical of the more than 40,000 cases of hydrocarbon exposures that are reported to poison centers in the United States each year. Hydrocarbons are actually compounds that are made of carbon and hydrogen atoms. There are numerous, numerous products. Uh, some of them are called petroleum distillates because they're refined from crude oils. So some of the products around the home and around the workplace that are considered hydrocarbons are gasoline, motor oil, lamp oil, kerosene, furniture polishes, uh, paint thinner, lighter fluid, turpentine, petroleum jelly, mineral oil, and cooking oil. And they're just some of the many products that are around um, that are readily available to kids as well as adults. When swallowed, most of these hydrocarbons actually are not absorbed out of the gastrointestinal tract and they don't produce systemic toxicity. They just sort of pass through. So if the substance is not aspirated, patients do fine and we quite frequently just leave them at home and, and, and uh, they don't require any medical treatment. Exceptions to this are solvents that contain other types of hydrocarbons, namely uh, there's a, a group called chlorinated hydrocarbons and they include um, one particular chemical called trichloroethane, and there's also a group called aromatic hydrocarbons that would include chemicals such as toluene that's used as a solvent, it's also in some of the, the more potent glues and adhesives that you can find around the home. But for the most part, um, the other hydrocarbons, the more common hydrocarbons, um, will produce injury through aspiration into the lungs when swallowing the liquid. So it's not even dose dependent. It just depends on whether they've aspirated or not. If they've aspirated, that'll produce a pneumonitis potentially that can be fatal. Toxicity of any particular hydrocarbon is related to the physical properties of that hydrocarbon or that substance. And the main um, physical property is viscosity. So liquids that have a low viscosity, and what that means, they're runny, they're kind of thin liquids, they flow readily, they're more likely to be aspirated than those with high viscosity. High viscosity liquids would be substances that are thick and sticky. And the uh, petroleum jelly would be a good example of that. 
surface tension uh, is the ability of the liquid to kind of creep or spread, and volatility, which is its tendency to vaporize, they also affect the likelihood of the substance being aspirated. So if something has a low surface tension and a high volatility, so it vaporize, vaporize, uh, excuse me, vaporizes uh, readily, then those compounds, which are compounds like gasoline, are more likely to be aspirated. Aspiration results in decreased surfactant production in the lungs, and that causes an alveolar collapse, um, causes insufficient oxygenation of the blood. And then ultimately, maybe a few days later, you can get a pneumonia, a secondary pneumonia. Uh, that occurs in, in patients with the pneumonitis. And you can also develop acute lung injury, which can be fatal. Now, most patients who have aspirated a hydrocarbon will have symptoms. They're, they're going to be coughing or choking and gagging immediately once they've aspirated. And so it is very easy in some cases to assess the patient right away, whether they're coughing or choking. If those symptoms persist longer than a few minutes following the ingestion, and particularly if they're accompanied by an increase in respiratory rate, then that patient is likely to develop a pneumonitis. Now, when... Um, on a physical exam, the patient may have crackles, they may have some wheezing, um, they may have vomited because these chemicals are very irritating to the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, they may have some hypoxia, respiratory distress, they have low oxygen saturation, and they may be cyanotic also. Lethargy occurs, and that's because the patient becomes hypoxic, and that can actually progress to coma. Children and adults who have no symptoms at all, you know, they have no coughing or choking uh, right away, or maybe they just coughed once or twice and no real choking along with that. They don't need to be transported to the emergency department unless the ingestion was deliberate. If it was deliberate, a suicide attempt, then certainly that patient needs to go into the emergency department. If symptoms are present, um, this coughing and choking or anything else, then they should be observed in the emergency department for at least six to eight hours. Treatment by EMS and in the emergency department consists of supportive care and maintaining the airway. Intubation may be required in serious cases. Activated charcoal doesn't bind hydrocarbons, and so it, it really doesn't do you any good to give activated charcoal, and you just increase the risk of some aspiration if you do give it. So avoid activated charcoal. Chest x-rays may show infiltrates, and they may show, they may be positive as early as 15 minutes after aspiration, or it may be hours later. Um, but usually you do see something on x-ray within four hours. We don't recommend uh, getting x-rays immediately upon arrival at the emergency department because they really don't predict the presence of pneumonitis later on. So th these, this is just a little information about um, aspiration of hydrocarbons. Certainly hydrocarbons can produce symptoms if they're inhaled. Um, you know, they are inhaled sometimes intentionally and they do produce neurologic symptoms. But uh, with, as with uh, ingestion, the main concern is aspiration of these products. It's important to call the poison center when you have a case like this because first we can help you identify whether or not the product actually contains a hydrocarbon because you often will not know what's in some particular products. And poison specialists will also help with assessing the patient for the risk of aspiration and, and serious pulmonary effects. So uh, definitely call the poison center uh, immediately, and the poison center number, as a reminder, is 1-800-222-1222. And it's important to remember that if it's not an easily identifiable product like gasoline, uh, you want to try to bring the bottle with you to the emergency department, whether you're transporting in an ambulance or you're maybe speaking to a patient over the phone to encourage them to bring that product container in with them so that you, so that you the healthcare professional, can have it in front of you when talking to poison control it's because there are so many different nuances in what's contained in different products. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. It is very important to bring the container in. And there are a number of products that contain hydrocarbons but also contain other toxins, um, like insecticides. Some insecticides are an insecticide that's um, dissolved or suspended or whatever in a, um, in a hydrocarbon, in a petroleum distillate. So you have to sort of weigh the toxicity of one uh, ingredient over the toxicity of the other ingredients. So it is important to know all the ingredients in there, in there not just whether it has a hydrocarbon or not. Um, and, and certainly we will look up the product, but in a lot of cases we will have you read the uh, ingredients 
off of the products that we know for sure what we're dealing with. Well, Lisa, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to put this information together and, and bring it here to us on the show. And I just want to remind everybody they can find out what more of what the Maryland Poison Center is doing at mdpoison.com, including signing up for the Tox Tidbits newsletter. Uh, it's a great little one-pager that Lisa puts together of uh, seasonal information and different things that are going on and, and just reminders. And it's one of those things I love. I actually print it out and hang it up at the firehouse for the paramedics to read. Thanks, Jamie. I appreciate that. I, I, you know, I hope it's helpful. I, we do get a lot of good feedback from people that it is. Uh, Tox tidbits is helpful um, in giving you just, you know, the basic information that you need to, to help the patients that you're dealing with. I love it because it's just the right length. You know, it's the kind of thing you can just stop and read on a bulletin board and then go on to do what you were doing. Um, and it just provides some really great information in a, in a concise format. So keep them, keep them coming, Lisa. We certainly will. Thanks. And that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Nursing Show. I want to thank all of you for checking out the program this week. It's great to have you following up on the show and checking in with us. Just make sure you head over and check out the additional resources and links and information you can find over at The Nursing Show website. That can be found at nursingshow.com. You can also get back in touch with me. Send those emails in to nursingshow at gmail.com. I love to hear from you. And I've been hearing from quite a few of you over the recent weeks. So keep those emails coming in. Let me know what you want to hear more of or check out more of on the show. Or maybe you watch the show and get it on one of the Roku, Roku set-top boxes, for instance. All of those are great information for me. And I love to hear from each and every one of you. So keep those emails coming. If you want to catch up with me on social media tracks, well, you can do so. You'll find me in most places under the handle Podmedic, and that is, of course, twitter.com slash podmedic and facebook.com slash podmedic. And don't forget the Nursing Show fan page on Facebook. That is growing and continuing to become more and more vibrant as people continue to contribute, uh, leave comments and suggestions, click the like button on different articles that I post there throughout the week. And I want you to become a fan over there. And you can do that just by going to facebook.com slash nursing show. Click the like button right there near the top of the page and become an official fan of the show. And of course, if you're already a fan, thanks a lot. And remember that every time you visit there and click the like button on a post that comes through your news stream, you are continuing to share the nursing show with your friends and family and colleagues that are friends of yours on Facebook. And that's a great way to support the nursing show. So don't be afraid to leave a comment or click a like button on an article because that's a great way to support the show. And we appreciate that. This is a community effort and the nursing show continues to grow and become more and more popular, largely because of your support. That's it for me. I'm going to go ahead and close out the show. I'm Jamie Davis, your host, and I want to remind you to stay safe and stay tuned here to the nursing show. Take care.